Um, hi, welcome everybody. Yet again for another incredible Living Hasidus Life Skill Series. For everyone who's new, Living Hasidus is an organization that runs in Crown Heights and we care for the needs of single and newly married women. We also have a very strong married alumni group. So call to everybody who's Mar alumni group joining tonight. Um, this event is open to men and women, just in case I know I sometimes get these questions, but Living Hasidus is primarily a women's organization. Tonight, we have the great chus of learning some life skills. Our Monday nights, we do life skills and you can always join eight to nine Monday nights for the next, between now and Pesach, Merit Hashem. We have all kinds of amazing speakers. Our goal of our life skills is to really give people the knowledge of what they always wish they would have known. So, or they wish, we basically want to prevent the concept of, I wish I would have known. Um, we want to make sure that people are prepared and being that our, our majority of our um, community is single women. So we want to give them these skills now while they have time to think. And we have all kinds of different speakers, whether it's health, whether it's financial education, whether it's organizing, whether it's, we have all kinds of amazing speakers. So every Monday night, you're always invited. Um, so I want to start by thanking every single one of you for joining us tonight. And um, I want to share that tonight's share um, is in schus for Leili Nishmas, for the sister of a good friend of ours, and is also the aunt of one of our Living Chassidus members. So we're doing Leili Nishmas, Leia Bas Yechanan, and she should have an Elias and the Shama and everything um, should be easy and we should be reunited with our loved ones right now with the coming of Mashiach. Amen. Um, okay, now we have amazing, amazing schos to have, hold one second, to have, um, here we go, okay, to have the, um, the brother, essentially, of one of our top living Hasidus members. We love her so much. A huge shout out to Shira. Um, and tonight we have the great schools of hearing for her, from her brother. Um, Adam Nesinov is a businessman and a shliach who has built a successful business and supports many organizations such as Living Hasidus, and I know so many others. So a huge kolakavo, especially for everyone who joined us last time, two weeks ago with Beryl Solomon, about the brachas of tzedaka. So Hashem should bench Adam Nesanov, Rabbi Nesanov, with abundant, abundant parnasa and brachas in everything in his life. Um, and Baruch Hashem, he'll be joining us tonight, and he will be sharing about how to build ourselves and how to set ourselves up for financial success. So as a Hashem, we will too, we too will be able to um, support so many organizations just like him. So thank you so much, Rabbi Nesanoff, and I'm going to pass the mic on to you. Can you hear us? You've been... Can you hear see. me? Check, check. Yes. Yes, we hear you. You're all terrific, set. Terrific, terrific. For thank starters, you so much. I'll say, thank you, thank you. I'll start as I'll say, I'm sorry if there's any kids in the background, but the time change my kids just went to sleep a little while ago. So hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be no screaming. Um, for starters, I like the way Beryl started it by saying that uh, please turn your cameras on. It's much nicer speaking to a few more faces than like the three or four that are on. Uh, half a dozen could just turn on. I won't be as tough as Beryl was, but if a few more could turn on, it'd be helpful. Let's give it just a moment. Also, just a reminder, the way that we do our recording, your, your picture will not show up. It will just be Rabbi Nesanov. So you can turn on your camera without any, any worries. Perfect. I appreciate it. I won't be as strict as Beryl, but if a few more want to go on, that'd be helpful. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll actually speak about for a second from Beryl's. Personally, I had an amazing takeaway. Um, I Baruch Hashem always give chaymish to tzedaka, but um, 20%. And he inspired me to push even further. I spoke to my mashpia for a while, uh, arguing back and forth, and he agreed. 
and um, I took on a chlata, which I've already fulfilled since the last time that um, because of the situation in Ukraine, I decided I would give beyond everything, I'd give $10,000 to the different Ukrainian causes. And um, I found Rabbi Osman, who's one of the few shluchim left in the Ukraine. He's in Kiev. He had some massive GoFundMe campaign. Baruch Shem, they've raised maybe half a million dollars. So I created a team page and I, I just wrote in a little text. I figured if I'm going to give, might as well just call it matching and try and get other people to also give. So I sent it around and said, I'll match dollar for dollar. So um, Baruch Shem, to date, I've matched about $6,000 there. That page raised about 12,000. Then I gave 2,500 to Charity for Israel, Rabbi Gulchavsky's organization that he said he's paying for, I mean, he does amazing things year round, but he said he's paying for the rent of uh, refugees coming over. And then there's another page, I don't remember, it was um, like 17 shluchim from Ukraine on one page, charity or something. So I gave 2,500 there. So I, I even pushed past the 10,000, but it's all because of living Chassidus last time. Famous, it was. So anyway, um, anyway, so uh, first of all, I apologize if I'm looking down a little bit. I'm, I'm a very private person and therefore I really never given the speech before. Um, so you'll have to forgive me, but on the other hand, it's a good opportunity. You'll get to learn a few things, which uh, probably other people aren't gonna say. And uh, yeah. Anyway, so a little disclaimer. I'm not a financial guru. They don't exist. If you see on Facebook, uh, sign up, make a million dollars. Don't sign up, you won't make a million dollars. Um, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. It's not a, a proper financial advice. It's just uh, educational things that you could implement. But I will explain sincerely how you could actually become a millionaire. I'm not saying tomorrow. If you stay till the end, you'll understand. I'm not saying tomorrow, but, but, I, but you really can if you follow these steps. Anyway, I want to start a step back, though, a little more ruchnius, then we'll get to gashmius. Um, money isn't happiness. It, it might sound obvious, especially to uh, the crowd here. However, um, the billionaire divorce rate, in fact, if you want to shoot up beyond billionaire, the top three, four richest people in the world are pretty much divorced. So it's not, uh, you know, you might be married or, or not yet and uh, have slight financial strains and think, boy, money could solve everything. It doesn't solve everything. Sometimes or oftentimes it makes more problems. Um, in fact, an interesting thing, Kevin O'Leary, who's a world famous investor, he's uh, one of the sharks on Shark Tank, if you've heard of it, um, invested in hundreds of companies. He, he uh, I saw this crazy clip of his. Um, it was a question and answer at university. And someone asked him, I, they, they said, I started this company in my dorm room. It's, I, I don't remember exactly. It follows the financial markets and reports it through an app, whatever. I've never heard of the app before. Nonetheless, he said it's making 3 million a year or something, which is crazy for a dorm room. He said he's looking to grow it. And he thinks when he, by the time he graduates, he can, uh, he, can, he can get outside investment and then go public eventually and just, just take this and this could be the next billion dollar company. He said the only thing is his, his girlfriend or fiance, I think it was fiance even, eh, she's not so into it. She wants to live a more simple life, doesn't want to move to, to the big city, doesn't want to have her face plastered everywhere in newspapers. She, she doesn't want it. So he said to Kevin O'Leary, the most, one of the most famous investors in the world for small businesses, for, for, for the little guy, he said, what do you recommend I do? And Kevin O'Leary's advice, astonishingly enough to me, he said, which is harder to replace? Now, the way I touch what he said, unfortunately, is he's saying, actually, he, he spelt it out a little more. It was obvious this is what he was saying. He was saying, good, a girl comes and goes, but how, how hard it is to start a business that makes a few million that has the potential of making a billion? That was his response. Now, I think his answer was correct, but I think he was looking at it incorrectly. It is a good question, which is harder to replace. However, you have to understand what, what does it mean to replace? If you look at a fiance as just you know, a girl, someone of the other gender that you're gonna marry at some point, there's billions of girls on the planet. But if you look at it as the right one, the only one, the, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're how they're half your neshama, you're, you're, you're gonna build a life together, have kids together. It's actually much harder to replace. If, you, if you're in Shaduchim, been through Shaduchim, which is a much better system than, than he's in in dating, nonetheless, still very difficult. Uh, you really appreciate that which is harder to replace. And again, I'm starting with these things, which is 10 steps back. Um, you know, if I'm going to tell you how to be a millionaire, I got to first make sure you're going to be healthy with it. So um, the next thing is the scorecard in life is often money. 
it's often how people define themselves. If you see amongst, you know, business geniuses, it's called their net worth. How much, are they, how much is he worth? How much does he make? That's the big, big scorecard in the business world. I guess if you play soccer, the, the obvious way, you know, no one tells you at the end of the game, wow, you got a good kick. I mean, maybe someone will, but ultimately they first care about who won the game, who got most points. So the scorecard in life, unfortunately in the world, is money. However, I could, I, I could tell you firsthand, I'm not saying with me, but I could explain in a second that money does not bring happiness. Um, I actually own and run an addiction treatment center, and it's a very high-end one. Um, I'd say about 50% of my clients fly in on private jets, very, very high-end one. And, and um, I mean, for starters, they're all addicts. They all, they all have um, a lot of difficulties, a lot of marriage problems. Um, they're very good people, but, but, uh, but it's, not, it's not a stretch to say that they're not happy. Um, money didn't bring happiness. And I think that for them, it's so clear because they've reached the scorecard. Most people in life don't reach the scorecard, don't reach the, the supposed scorecard. Most people chase it, pay the bills, maybe give a little extra stuff and maybe buy a second home, whatever, but most people don't get it. But when they actually got it, they realized it's empty. It's not really the scorecard. And therefore it brought to problems. So Baruch Hashem, I'm here sitting in front of you telling you firsthand, again, not from myself, but from my, what I see from other people, it's, it's, um, I could guarantee it's not the scorecard. My last thing, Baruch Nis, and then I'll get into the Gash Nis. Um, it's interesting also with money, you have to know the why. I watch a lot of these, um, I said before the word guru is a bad word, but I watch all these financial advisors on YouTube and online. I, I mean, a lot of the information I'm giving you, I didn't invent. I just, <laughs> I, I'm always educating myself in these topics. I never went to business school. I didn't, I, I have a degree from Morristown in uh, whatever, rabbinic studies, whatever they're called, uh, Talmudic studies, but um, I have smicha, but, but it doesn't teach business. Um, although I have to say a lot of the Bobbitchers, they have a good cup, they have a good head and they do very well because of it. So there, there's definitely not a, uh, not a disconnect. It's very connected. Nonetheless, um, a lot of these guys online, they don't say the why, meaning that there are guys I watch that make, I mean, it's just crazy. They make tens of millions of dollars a year. Some of these guys just off of YouTube views alone, they make $6 million a year. Then they have investments, then they have uh, sponsorships and they have, it's crazy. It's, I mean, some of these guys are talking numbers in the hundreds of millions. And, and, they're, and they're very, I mean, really smart guys, really good guys that they're sharing it with the public and whatever, and it's very nice. Nonetheless, the one thing they never, and a lot of them are even very frugal. They're not into like buying the Lamborghinis and the Bentleys and whatever. They're very into smart investing, but the one thing they never discuss is why, what's the point? <laughs> Meaning they, they, they wanna grow the number. They wanna be, if you have a hundred million, wanna be a billion, if they have whatever. In fact, this one guy is a hundred million, he wants to be a billion, that's his thing, which, which is fine. It's not, money's not bad. But, but why? What's the point? What's the difference? It almost makes more sense for the ones who want to spend it. I mean, I just don't understand why. So it's important to know the why. So, I mean, personally, the why, and, and I assume we all connect with this, especially coming off of Beryl's speech last week. It was, it was, I don't think it was planned, but it, it is perfectly planned. You first have to know, he's, he, actually, my, one of my first notes is that, um, I'll get to in a second, but Beryl's right. I mean, the only real way to make money is to give it stucca. And it's, and it's a cycle. You give stuff, you do make more money. So that's the why for me. I mean, obviously that's, uh, um, it, it's concurrent. It's not the next level, but also it's very important to support your family. Baruch Hashem, we should all have, get married, have a lot of kinderlach, healthy kinderlach, have a lot of tuition for yeshivas, <laughs> seminaries, have a lot of weddings to pay for. Baruch Hashem, it's, it's expensive. I mean, my oldest is four and I have three kids and it's already expensive. <laughs> um, Okay, that's all the Ruchnias. Let me introduce myself. So my name's Adam Nesanoff, or as I'm known here, Shira's brother. Um, I've been her brother for many years. Here, she turned off her camera. She turned it on before. Okay. Um, so when I was 23 years old, I, I, uh, when I was 23 years old, I started a business with my father from scratch. We both, it was our first venture like this. We started an addiction treatment center in Florida, a drug rehab. Um, it was our first experience doing this. We, we you know, both are very talented individuals, but it was very new. And I really jumped in. Uh, I, when I started, I didn't know, for example, do you need a license? You know, we used to, I remember we used to go to the public library in Boca to meet. Um, Baruch Hashem was humble beginnings. Now we have a center, we have an office in Boca. We, we uh, each have houses, whatever, you know, it, it, it's grown. Um, 
but uh, whatever. It's, it's, I mean, I have a lot of little stories that I'm going to kind of put aside. I have one central cob tonight. Uh, at the end, I maybe have like some questions I'll do, whatever. Um, at some point, I, I, I have experience and things I've learned of, of yeah, I don't know how to buy a house from A to Z. I've bought a few houses. I've, I've lost money in buying houses. I know what not to do. I've lost my $10,000 mistake would be someone else's uh, benefit. I mean, that's the beauty of learning. Um, anyway, so let me look down. So I said this good. It's doing, yeah, I run the business. I have some real estate investments, currently work uh, doing other businesses. Fine. So I personally have a few different investment vehicles. Um, no need to get into right now, but uh, you'll see. There's so many specifics when choosing how to invest, what to invest. Um, I'm going to explain some basics. Um, and obviously, I'm going to build concepts, and then we'll get there. Hopefully, it's not too much like a math class. I'll keep it interesting. Um, certainly, you could post comments. I'll try and get to them at the end. Um, hopefully, just the topic itself is juicy enough. Um, a lot of people do speaking. It's like inspirational. You could tune in halfway and get a vart and leave, whatever. This is a little more structured, but uh, bear with me. It's not so long. So for starters, no question, tzedakah and Torah mitzvahs is the best way to make money. 100% my own experience. Um, in fact, I'll tell one little story. Um, when when uh, it, it takes a few years to get a business off the ground, there was a point where you know we were doing okay, and um, we wanted to pledge to to our shliach um, a, a pledge in the five figures. It was a fifty thousand dollar pledge. So it was for his building, and he he said very generous. But the place you want to sponsor, it's meant to be a hundred thousand. So we were like, okay. My father's very into bitachon. He said, okay, let's do it. So I'm thinking, okay, my, the rest of my life I'll be paying this off. Uh, nonetheless, and I was making a cheshbon five hundred dollars a month. I could handle it. I, nonetheless, Baruch Hashem, in, in uh, I don't know about a year, we paid it off, and we've done several more big pledges to a lot of places. So no question, Torah mitzvahs. Nonetheless, you do need a keli. For the orbister to give hashba, you have to have a keli. You can't sit on a couch pledging on the phone with different organizations and expecting it's going to fall. Um, it's not, I don't recommend either sitting there with a thousand lottery tickets, scratching away, hoping that uh, you have big pledges. It's not, in fact, when I was a kid, I remember when I was old enough to buy lottery tickets, it was in the $400 million range one time. I was sitting there before buying a ticket. I'm going to give 80% to stuck. Uh, let me win. Gonna, it doesn't work. You know, halavai, but it doesn't work. You have to build a real keli. Anyway, so in, it, in my mind, there's three ways to make money. Three different ifanim. One is a main income, meaning you have a job, you have a business. You, uh, whatever, that's pretty much the two big options in life. Number two, oh, there's a baby crying. Um, number two, um, passive income or investments. Now, the passive income is like the, uh, the worst words in the world because it's pretty much fake. Um, there's no actual passive income in life. Nothing just happens to you. Um, there's a famous guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a big financial guru. And uh, hold on one second. Turn off my camera so my wife I could run by to get the baby. Hold on one second. Turn it off. Um, I'll keep speaking though for a moment. So anyway, Gary Vaynerchuk, he's actually a Yid, a Russian Yid, I believe, who came to America. Very, very successful financial guy. And he says, let me turn it back on. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, he says that um, that passive income is, is 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 a big bad word that millennials jump on because it sounds great, but it doesn't exist. You have to work to do things. Nothing just happens. But nonetheless, as funny as it is, that's the main category tonight. I want to talk about the investments. It's not really passive, but it it uh, you know it's still it's still uh, still investment income. The third way is equity, which is a really really interesting way. Um, I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to get into each one much more in depth. Anyway, the third one is equity. It could be equity in a house. It could be equity in, in uh, uh, businesses. It could be, I guess, those are the two main ones that come to mind. Anyway, so let's go into categories. The first one, main income. So this is the quickest way to make money up front. You have a job. You, you, uh, you uh, have business. You, you get a paycheck monthly, weekly, whatever. I pay myself monthly, depending on how the month was. It's money. It sits up front. Nothing's going to beat it as far as speed. However, there's a few other things. There's taxes, bad word. Uh, on Purim, you boo by Haman and by taxes. Um, anyway, taxes are... Uh, so, so the main income is the worst taxes. It, uh, there's federal taxes, state taxes. I don't know, city taxes. If you're, I don't know, whatever. Baruch Shem in the, the great state of Florida where I am, there's no state taxes. 
I, I never made money in New York when I, I lived there when I was a kid, but I could not imagine living in a state where you're literally paying anything beyond you have to. <laughs> Certainly go to California, it's 10% on New York, it's 8%, it's crazy. I, anyway, um, so there's, there's the most taxes there, whatever you're even in Florida, so I don't have the state income tax, the federal taxes, depending on the bracket, could be whatever, I don't know, 10%, 20%, 30%, higher. Um, anyway, so if you want to make more money in this way, it's easy. Get a higher paying job, work harder, start a business. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very straightforward. There is what to go into more of how to start a business, practically, whatever. I, again, I'm not really going to get into that tonight. Maybe if we'll have questions at the end, I could. I do you hear the baby screaming or you don't hear it? Okay, good. Um, then um, actually one, one little tip I'll give on that of how to make more money in the main income. This is, uh, I'm quoting a lot of different guys. So again, I'm, I'm helping you from having to do all this research. So Grant Cardone, I don't know if you've heard of him, not an esoteric guy, very well-known guy. So he, he um, is very famous with 10X. That's his whole brand, 10X. He has a big conference. He has, I mean, he's billion dollars of real estate. Um, very interesting guy. He says that um, when he was younger, he got his life together in his late twenties. He was a mess before then drugs and whatever. So he says, that he, how did he initially do well? He initially did well for one reason. He had a, I don't know, a phone sales job. He said that he was no smarter, no more educated, no, no better at anything. Very simple. What he did, he did 10 times more than everyone else. Meaning what? Uh, people made, I don't know, in a phone center, you know, a hundred calls, he'd make a thousand calls, literally. And by definition, if you do 10 times more effort, it will produce more, maybe not 10 times more results, but it'll produce more, you'll do better. So he actually, his whole theory has two parts, the 10 times more effort. And the second part is the dream 10 times more. So he has a book, I think called the 10X rule. And in the book, it's interesting. He says that the second part only recently, 20, 30 years after he came up with this, that he actually internalized. What's the 10X dream? The 10X dream, he said, some people actually fight him about it because they'll say, what if you fall short of the dream? You're, you're shooting so high, you might fall short. So his answer is very simple. Wouldn't you rather, instead of shooting for 100,000, shoot for a million and fall short of a million instead of fall short of 100,000? So only now, later in life, when he's really doing spectacularly, is he thinking the 10x dream. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, Grant Cardone. One other point I have about the main income is about taxes again. Even though I said we uh, boo at taxes, one benefit is taxes aren't all bad. Um, I was actually myself speaking to a financial advisor recently about how different things to do with money instead of paying taxes. Um, taxes aren't all bad. Taxes are good if you wanna get a loan. I'm not gonna get so into this tonight, but it's just something to bear in mind. If you wanna buy a house, if you wanna, even buying a house, it's, it's good to plan you know, a year or two ahead, not six months behind, because you can't do anything in behind. But if you plan ahead, you, you do have to show on taxes a certain income if you wanna get a house, wanna get a loan. It, it's actually important. It, it sounds funny. Some people try and have more stated tax, taxable income than even they, I'm, I'm trying to bunch things together, whatever they could do. Just, just a point. Again, I'm not really getting into this so much right now. Okay, category two was the uh, passive income or investments. So this one has the most potential and the lowest taxes. So uh, this is like uh, stocks, real estate. Nowadays, people have cryptocurrency. I personally don't have any cryptocurrency, maybe like 20 bucks or something. I bought like $20 of Bitcoin. But, um, but uh, there are people very into it that do very well from it. Nonetheless, stocks, real estate, these kinds of things. So they actually have the lowest taxes, interestingly enough, which the logic behind is it's the second time around. You made money, you paid your, your big taxes. Now you're investing it and you still have to get taxed. It's the chutzpah they tax the second time around, but it's a lower tax bracket. I think the highest amount like 20% or something, or just over 20%, but it's significantly lower. It could be you know, $10 million and it's at a lower percent. So the investments is what I wanna get into tonight, but I'll just address the third category, then we'll get back into the main for the night. Am I going too slow? Sometimes I speak too fast. I was on Merkel Schlichus in like the middle of nowhere in Washington. And I, uh, I gave a whole like hour speech. And at the end, a lady raised her hand and I said, yes. She said, you speak very fast. <laughs> so I'm originally from New York. I speak fast. My biggest uh, goal tonight is to speak a little slower. Um, anyway, equity. So most of the wealthiest people in the world have most of their wealth in equity. Equity is actually very powerful. 
Um, if you think about, again, the, the biggest billionaires, not our star role models, but good examples um, as far as this, they, they have their wealth tied up in equity. They, they might have, you know, the, the billionaires of the world, they have, uh, could be a hundred billion dollars, but it's really mostly in their company that they own. Um, now equity is interesting. Um, but equity could be real estate also. Equity is nice, it's not taxed. Of course, unless you sell it, but really it's not taxed. Um, even a, obviously you have to support yourself. So equity is a way to, to, to grow your, your net worth. But um, here I said, can you translate equity? Um, here, let me Google translate equity. It's a tough word. It's like, let's see, equity definition. Equity, the, the value of the shares issued by a company. The quality of being fair and impartial. I don't know. It's it's the value value. I guess the value of your ownership of of something of some asset. That's a good. Wow, I just came up with that. The value of ownership of some asset. So, for example, a simple one: if you buy a house, a half a million dollar house, you put down twenty percent, save up, put down a hundred thousand dollars. Already, you have a hundred thousand dollars equity in your house. You own the house, but really four hundred thousand of it is a loan. The bank owns that portion. And as you pay your mortgage, say 30 years later, forget about the fact that the house 100% goes up in value, you now have half a million dollars equity. Suppose, I assume the house might be worth a million dollars in 30 years. I don't know where it is, what it is, but then you'd have a million dollars of equity. Now, equity, again, isn't cash, but it's real, real, real value. And equity, if you keep it just in the value, you don't have to pay any taxes on it. In fact, a lot of real estate guys, they do, it's something called a 1031 exchange. Even when they sell the property and get real money, they turn the, the air equity into real money. They don't pay taxes on it because there's, if you within, it's a whole process, but you have to identify a new property. And within six months, you could buy a new property. You didn't have to pay taxes on it. So you can keep growing and growing and growing. You could sell one building, make profit a million dollars, but you keep rolling and rolling and you never pay tax on it until you finally take it out and actually use it. Anyway, um, actually an interesting thing, oh, whatever. Next thing. Um, I'm getting too much in equity. Equity can be, I'm just looking at my notes, equity can be gained by putting money in or even time. It's just an interesting thing also that um, equity is, if you wanna start a venture or something, it doesn't have to be just money putting. It could be your time, your effort, your talent, your skill. Um, you could go with a partner, they put up the money, you put up the, 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 the skill, and now you own 50% equity in a company that you put no money into. Um, one other thing, final thing about equity, and then I'll get into to how you become a millionaire. To equity, uh, these are important things you want to know later. Um, it's actually always important. There, there's always it's good to know uh, things about finances. Again, it, it could be a boring topic or it's very interesting. Um, okay, so equity is um, very attractive because there's a multiplier, at least for business. We'll talk for a second. What does that mean? So, for example, if I have a business that profits say a hundred thousand dollars a year, that's great. That's real cash in my pocket. But say I wanted to sell the business. How do I sell it? What do I, am I selling it for $100,000? Why would I do that? Just, just keep it. So they pay me a multiple on the, on the number that the business makes. So maybe I'm making it up. Every industry has its own multiple depending on different factors. So say it's five times multiple, meaning that if I, my business profits $100,000, I could say someone should buy it for me for $500,000. So here's the interesting thing about equity. Say that my business this year, I, I work so hard and I make it make 120,000 instead of 100,000. So short term right now, I have an extra $20,000. This year I made an extra 20,000 in the past. But the cool thing is this, my equity went up way more. Meaning now my business, instead of being worth 500,000, which is five times 100,000, it's worth 600,000, which is five times 120,000. So with my little bump of 20,000, I just actually, in equity, gained $100,000. So equity is a nice thing because of that. Your, your value can be multiplied. Um, okay, fine. Let's keep going. Um, I, I do have stories and things uh, peppered in this, but the beginning, I guess I just put a bunch of terms and things. Um, okay, next. A few financial concepts that I'll, I'll tie together, but it's just good to know. So leverage is an amazing thing with investing. Um, loans, basically, a loan. A loan can allow you to buy better assets. What does that mean? So say I have $100,000 and I want to buy real estate. I can go buy a $100,000 piece of real estate. 
you know, that's wonderful. Uh, again, I'm not doing real estate investing tonight, but you know, $100,000 apartment is only going to pay so much rent. Or I could take my $100,000 and buy a $500,000 apartment because that's 20% down and get an 80% loan. And on a $500,000 apartment house, whatever it is, I guess Crown Heights would be apartment. <laughs> Most of the world's a house. Um, so in the $500,000, it pays much more rent. So now my equity is growing much greater. And uh, in general, my rent is growing, my cash flow. So that's the concept of a loan. Loans aren't all bad. I know we think about like credit cards being bad, but it's, it's a very different style. Um, it's, it's actually because of compound interest, which I'll get into in a moment. But also there's a concept of low interest debt is not bad. It's very interesting. I'm throwing out a lot of concepts tonight. I really apologize if it's too much. Um, Gordon Ramsay is a big financial guru again, but I'm not in the sense of promising to make you billions, but just educational. And he is so anti-debt. It's very interesting. I was by a shliach, America shlichus, who subscribes to him like crazy. And I'm not saying in a bad way, very good way. And he is so against debt. He does not have any debt at all. I think even, I think even um, his real estate, he wants to buy in cash. He doesn't want any debt. Or maybe just the Chabad house could not be. But really, cars, anything. He does pa'ulas, Moshe uh, no debt well. <laughs> no debt. Anyway, however, I personally believe, and this is not from me, it's from a lot of people I watch, low interest debt is good. You know, you buy a house. Nowadays, the rates are going up a little bit, but you get a 3%, 3.5% interest rate. It's very low. It's, 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 it's actually very worth it. Um, I wasn't going to get so into, so much into um, inflation, but also inflation nowadays is going up, meaning money right now is worth more than money tomorrow or 10 years from now. Meaning you might hear your grandparents say, I made $50 a week, and you're thinking, how did they survive? It actually means that money used to be more valuable. When they used to buy a house for $2,000, it means their money was more powerful. Money is weakening over time. So really, if, if you had a half a million dollars now, don't, buy, don't put it all into a house. It's silly. Put $100,000 down because the other $400,000 is so valuable right now. You're paying off over 30 years. And 30 years from now, it's a fixed, uh, a lot of most loans are fixed interest rate, meaning they're, they're, they're doing in today's money, even though money comes weaker over time. The concept with investing, by the way, again, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit. I will, I will, I promise I'll give a very central cob of what to do. I'm just talking around a bit for bringing a bit with money. But with low interest debt, it's very valuable to look and say with investments, how much could I make on my money? Meaning with the $400,000 that I'm not putting down on the house because I'm getting a loan, maybe I could invest it. So even though I'm, I'm taking a loan for 3%, what if I can make 10% on my invested money? That means the difference of the 7% is how much I'm profiting. Anyway, that was a little complex, but I'm about to say it clearer. So how could successful investors think is very simple. There's three letters, ROI, return on investment. I don't care what the investment is. It could be real estate, it could be business, it could be, it could be uh, hamburgers, it could be Bitcoin, it, could be, it doesn't make a difference. The only thing that investors care about is return on investment. It, it, that's it. Say a guy, I give a, a clean example, say a guy has a million dollars, wants to invest. He, he doesn't care what it goes in. He wants, I mean, real estate's good because it's safe. It's, it's there, it's really there. You could sell it anytime. But all you care about is getting ROI, return on investment. So say you have a million dollars and you get a 7% ROI. That means every year you're making $70,000 on your million. That's amazing. People, you know, people, so really uh, that's the goal. Keep investing and, and uh, eventually do that. So let's see, I think I'm gonna get, okay, almost, almost there, bringing it all together. I have words on my page, bringing it all together. Um, so the question is, how do you safely and successfully get the highest ROI? No headaches, no heartaches. I'll explain what I mean by heartaches and headaches. I, I have a, a Robinhood app. I put a few thousand dollars in it, invested in Tesla and Apple, nothing crazy. I put whatever, a few thousand. It is the biggest headache and heartache. I get every day a text, Tesla's up 5%, Tesla's down 5%, Tesla's up 5%, Tesla's down 5%. It, is, it drives me crazy. It's not worth it. I don't care how well Tesla is doing. For me, it's not worth it. It's a headache. Um, so here's, here's a little more tachlis. So Warren Buffett, um, maybe people have heard of him. He's uh, the, truly the most famous investor in the world. He's in his late 80s. He's good friends with Bill Gates, or whatever. I mean, he's, he's, he's up there. He's actually, I think, probably the most philanthropic person in the entire world. Um, he gave 
maybe $90 billion to charity over, over the last few years. Um, he is an unbelievable investor. So anyway, he made a bet, I think in 2008 or 2009 with hedge fund uh, uh, investors, a hedge fund. Um, again, I'm not like the dictionary definition of everything, but hedge fund is basically a big fund that very uh, intelligent people, or we, we hope they're intelligent, they invest the money into the stock market and different things. And again, all their investors care about is three letters, ROI. So you invest with a hedge fund because you hope that these guys know what they're doing and get a good ROI. So Warren Buffett made a bet with them. He said that I bet that you can't beat the market. What does that mean? The market is, is means the entire stock market. I don't know how far back to get. I, I assume people have heard of the stock market. I don't know if people, I have to explain what that is. It's fine if I do. Should I explain? Whatever. Okay. Stock market is just basically there's, there's, I'm looking. Okay. So the stock market is basically you have privately held companies and publicly held companies. My company is privately held, not because of the size, although it's, it is a small company. You have honestly a Trump organization, it's a multi billion dollar company. It's privately held. It's, it, he owns it completely, him, his family, whatever. Um, publicly held companies means that you go public. It means that anyone can buy into the company. When you buy a stock, you're literally buying a piece of that company. And you actually have a say in the company. They have sh every year shareholders meetings, you get to vote. You know, okay, if you go to Apple and have uh, 10 stocks, they're not gonna care so much what you say, but the point is there, you actually own a piece of a company. So on, on the, when people invest, you can't invest in my company, it's not available, but you can invest in a lot of these companies, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I have no idea how many on the stock market, maybe millions. So there's something called the market, people call it. It's actually the S&P 500. I don't know what it stands for, something, in, uh, um, whatever, some standard. Nowadays, just S&P 500. So what is it? It's 500 of the, not the largest, but 500, I don't know how to say, the safest companies on the stock market. And it's, it's a real cross-section. It was big news uh, two years ago, Tesla was accepted. And you have Apple, Tesla, you have but a, lot of, a lot, a lot of stocks. Companies you've never heard of, companies you've heard of. It's not all the same size. Some companies are very small, some are very big. Some are, you could type in Google Images, S&P 500. You'll see a chart that looks like, like some big circles, small circles, whatever you'll see, and you'll see how much of each one. So, so that's just like a cross section of the market. If you cut it in half, you know, the good market, not like all these little companies that come and go, that's, that's, that's the definition. So it, he said, you can't, I bet over 10 year period, forget about one year, 10 year period, I bet no one can beat the market, meaning beat the S&P 500. So he said, I'm gonna bet a million dollars. He bet a few of these other uh, big hedge fund uh, big shots. 10 years later, again, I don't remember if it was 2018 or 2019, nobody won. <laughs> nobody beat the market. Meaning what? Meaning if you, you could buy shares in, in there's, there's certain funds that basically follow the S&P 500. S&P 500 isn't a stock, it's a, it's a, a, uh, a standard. But you could buy different stocks that followed exactly. And, and there's a few of them that are different uh, price points. You know, some are $100, some are $10 that follow the market, basically. And, and basically, if you bought those, you would have beat investing in your money with these big hedge fund billionaires. They couldn't beat the market, which is crazy. It just shows that <laughs> it's just incredible. It's a wild thing. Um, it's funny. I actually saw a video of this guy. There's a, there's a line that a monkey can beat. Uh, uh, a monkey could beat most of these hedge fund guys. So I watched a video. A guy had a monkey pick, I don't know, he, he folded little pieces of paper of like the top 100 performing stocks. He picked 30 of them. The guy, or maybe, what was it? Maybe 10 of them. And he put $10,000 in each. This was uh, just over a year ago. And a year later, he actually beat most of these uh, hedge fund guys. These 10 stocks picked completely random by a monkey. So nonetheless, these hedge fund billion, don't, don't feel bad. You don't have $20 million to invest in the hedge fund guys. It's not necessary. Um, so since 1957 is when the S&P 500 was created through 2021, we'll, we'll, we'll put aside this past year, um, the S&P 500 has made an average of 10.5% return on investment a year. That's the growth, 10.5% a year on average. Um, even in the last 10 years, it was like 15% or something. I see someone wrote, it's not timing the market. It's about, I, I can't see the rest of it. I'm not going to click it the second, but, but it, it's true about, um, if you wanted to beat the market for a year, you could. You know what I'm saying? Like if you invested in Tesla in 2020, it's gone up like, I don't know, 700%. Although, I, like I said, I get text daily, it goes down 5% a day. 
So, you know, you could beat the market for a year. That's not impressive. We, we, what do we care about a year? You, you gambling or investing? We want to beat it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and, and again, 1957 to 2021, my math offhand is not great, but what is that, 55 years? It's actually exactly 55 years that the, it's been 10.5% a year. That's including uh, the stock market crash in the 80s. It's including 2008. Um, hopefully it's including this year. This year right now is not so hot right now. But, um, but again, if you're, if you're gambling, if you're investing for this year, uh, you know, <laughs> keep your money aside. If you're investing for long-term, it's worthwhile. Anyway, so now let's bring it all together. The best way to make money is get a high paying job, pay taxes, buy a home, et cetera, live a nice life, beautiful. But the easiest way for anyone to be a millionaire is the following. Final tidbit before giving the answer. There's something called an IRA, a Roth IRA. These are retirement accounts, if you've heard of them. So the concept is, I'll give round number examples. Uh, boy, I'm going much slower than I thought. I thought I was going to speed through this. I time myself giving this whole thing. It was 15 minutes. <laughs> um, anyway, so IRA and Roth IRA, they're the same thing, but a little caveat to them. The concept of the IRA is that say you made $100,000 this year, you could put up to $6,000 aside into this account. It's like a, a vehicle. It's like a box you could put your money into. And within the box, you could invest in stocks and things, but it's a box. You can't take your money out, you get penalized. It's the way the government's forcing people to save. You could only touch it when you're 59 and a half years old. So if you're young, it's good. It's a good time to start. Um, if you're old, it's also good. It's never a bad time to start saving, but it's very good for, for if you're very young. So the IRA is a way that if you made 100,000, say, and you put 6,000 into it, you're only taxed on 94,000. That 6,000 is tax deferred. When do you pay it? When you ever you take it out and when you're 60 years old, you take it out, you're taxed on. Now the Roth IRA is a little different. And this is the one that the guys I watch recommend and I personally recommend as well for an interesting reason. The Roth IRA is a different kind of tax vehicle. You have to pay taxes. You make $100,000, you uh, put 6,000 aside, you still have to pay 100,000 in taxes. It's not a tax deferment. The beauty though, is you don't pay tax on the growth. Meaning you take this 6,000, invest it, in uh, depending how, how old or young you are in 30 years from now in whatever, 20 years from now, 15 years from now, it's gonna be worth statistically, like I said, 10 and a half percent interest, it's gonna be worth more. And that extra addition, you don't have to pay tax on at all. Um, anyway, so now let's, let's, let's uh, jump into the practical. So in the Roth, I, actually one thing I didn't say earlier, I'm sorry, I know I'm promising things and pulling back. There's something called compound interest. Compound interest is how credit cards get you. Compound interest means that I, I'll give the credit card example. I put $100 on my credit card or, or say I put whatever. I say at the end of the month, I have $100, $100 left over my card. Debt, yeah? I have to, they, they charge interest. Say the interest is $30. And I'm a chacham, I pay my minimum payment of $20. So now I have $110. The next month, my interest is not on the $100 that it was originally. It's including on their interest. And that's compound interest. It's every X amount of times a year. Credit cards is 12 times a year. Um, investing halavai, it's once a year really. But the point is that it's, it's, it's um, all, all, the interest is, 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 is going into the principal and now your principal is the new amount. The, the, the amount that is growing is, is inclusive of the, of the uh, interest. So that's what we're gonna get into now. So in a Roth IRA, there's a $6,000 limit yearly. So here we go. Investing and saving is so important. Ready for this? Whether it's realistic or not, make it realistic. It's worth it. Um, there's actually an interesting survey that if over 90% of Americans couldn't pay for a $400 emergency if, if it came up. You know, although everyone has a $1,000 iPhone and cars and whatever, <laughs> iPhones sell tens of millions a year. They come out with new ones. Okay, so here's a good example. Let's get juicy numbers. This is, you could type in on Google compound interest calculator. You'll see there's more complex ones, there's simple ones. I like the simple ones. So here you go, ready? If you started a, a, uh, uh, an account today, say Roth IRA, but that's again, just the tax vehicle. Say you today invested $0. Easy enough up front. everyone's got that. Say you put in $500 a month, which is your 6,000 a year. At the end, I'm gonna get into, by the way, um, how to get into the mindset of actually doing that because it's very nice and dandy unless you do it. So say you put $500 a month in, which is 6,000 a year and say it was for 35 years. 
Now, again, I don't know how old or young someone is. I mean, 35 years from now, which some everyone's healthy and well and keeps growing it. But as far as the uh, Roth IRA, you, you know, as far as when you cash out, cash in, but say 35 years. And by the way, with a spouse, you could each have one. So if you some do well, you could actually each do this. So, but anyway, but this is for one person. So again, $5 a month for 35 years, just $5 a month. If you put into an S&P 500 index fund, very, very safe, very, very safe overall over the long term, it's only grown. Maybe some years will dip and grow. You won't have the heartache of picking three individual stocks on Robinhood, getting the app notifications daily. You don't, you don't touch it. My dad gives a good muscle. It's like, um, you, the roulette wheel, it's in gambling. There's a wheel where you throw a ball and it goes around and you bet on black or white or a number. Say that each one's like black, white, black, white, black, white. Say you bet on white. So every time, imagine it bounced on black, you freaked out. Oh, oh I lost my money. It, it didn't stop yet. It only matters when the ball stops, whatever it lands on. So it, yeah, if, if it's down now and I cash out, I lose money. But, but don't even think about it. 30 years from now, think about it. Nonetheless, 35 years. 10.5%, which is the average. I'm not guaranteeing it yearly, but on average over 55 years, that's been the average. You'll have in 35 years, can you guess how much? So let's see, uh, the first time I'll do the chat. Just give a, give a number, we'll get a few things. No one? Whatever. Anyone gonna put an amount? Think what would, what would it be? Anyone? Okay, whatever, you heard this, did it. She either very, very smart or she uh, did the math. So again, the numbers are zero upfront, $500 a month for 35 years, a 10.5% average. That would be $2,016,572. Million, $2 million and, and because of this tax vehicle, it's, it's, it's meant to be tax-free. Um, again, I'm not an accountant, but this is the, the basics. So that's $2 million because you save $500 a month. And invest it, it's nothing. I, I, I'll, by the way, contrast that just to show the power of compound interest. Um, if you do the same scenario, again, 500 a month, nothing up front, but you did it for only 10 years, not 35 years. Guess what the growth would be? Let's see if uh, just quickly put in, let's see one or two people. Anyone? It's more fun if you just guess. If you do the math, it's not so fun. Is that it's a lot of zeros, no commas. Five hundred thousand. It's even less. It's one hundred and eight thousand. The same scenario for thirty-five years is two million. For ten years, one hundred eight thousand. Now, compound interest is like a snowball. Towards the end, it's even more valuable. One other figure to address that is, for example, if you did thirty years instead of thirty-five years, it would be one point one million dollars instead of over two million. Just those extra five years, it almost doubles. So compound interest is honestly, if I, if I had to give the class in 10 seconds, it would be compound interest. If you're young, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I went to public high school. I wish I was 17, they told you, because I'm already 28. I'm already 10 years too. I mean, it's amazing. It's crazy. Especially when you're younger, it's easier. I mean, I don't know, 500, but it doesn't, you, don't, you don't have to max it out. I'm just saying the max. So when you're younger, put $100, but whatever. It's unbelievable compound interest. So... Let's just do another scenario. Let's say uh, a little more realistic, maybe less realistic. I don't know. Depends on the person. Say you did an investment account and you had 3000 up front. You actually saved $3,000. Say that you saved $3,000 and, and you put that and then you did $5 a day. You could find either how to cut it out of your budget or you just, if you, if you daily uh, could convince yourself to do $5 extra for something silly that is a consumable that you eat and it's gone, you could probably do it for investments. And say five a day, including Shabbat Shalom Tevim, not to be done on Shabbat Shalom Tevim, but to be done later. Um, that would be $1,825 a year for 35 years. Again, this is the 3,000 up front and the 1,800 a year. And again, the same thing, put in investments and say the same average that's been averaging for 55 years. In 35 years, you'd have $712,000, which is it's good money. Someone wrote, I know it's not worth the same, whatever. Okay, it's true, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's worth a lot more than if you're 30 years from now and did nothing. Um, anyway, so compound interest is very good for young people and it sincerely could help you become a millionaire in a real way. Um, so with that money, just as a matter of interest, 
I'm going to finish off in just a few minutes and then probably, I actually wrote like a few questions myself. I figured people will ask, people have asked me in the past, then I'll open it up to questions. But um, with that money, by the way, again, I'm not a financial advisor at all, but with that money, there's a few things that people do. When people retire, what does it mean to retire? It means that say, say you do have that $2 million. What people do is they just live off the interest, off that, that, that return on investment. Meaning if it's, I'll even be more conservative and say seven to 10%, say you've 2 million saved up when you retire. The Rebbe wasn't into retirement, but that's in a, in a, in, in a functioning state. As far as working, it's, it's uh, even a, a good shliach in their 80s is not working as hard as they did when they're in their 40s. It's just a fact. Um, they're maybe doing other things, but financially speaking, it's good to have money when you're a little older. Um, nonetheless, if you were to live off just the seven to 10% interest off of $2 million, You'd be making one hundred forty to two hundred thousand dollars a year just off the interest. Your principal still exists. Your two million dollar nest egg or principal still there. You could you could always chas You need a little more. You could take it, but you just keep that investing and you live off the interest. That's what people do uh, later in life. Um, so my last uh, note that I have is that stocks aren't great now. I have to admit, you know, uh, Baruch Hashem, I, I uh, started a retirement account two years ago. The first year I was a Shlomazel, did not invest it. I had it sitting in that box. It was, it was a tax benefit to me, but I didn't invest it. This year I put more money into it and actually invested it and pumped the markets down right now. So I'm losing Baruch Hashem a good amount of money a day. But it doesn't really matter because yeah, someone just wrote stocks are on sale now. It's always good to buy when it's low. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a chutzpah to say because uh, you buy and tomorrow loses money, but but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, they will go up. Um, and anyway, so, uh, but the fact is you could still fund the Roth IRA now. You could open up that fund. You could open up that vehicle, that box and put money into it. And it's a good box because you can't touch the money. For emergencies, you can touch it, but the, you get penalized. If you want to use it, there are different uses for higher education. If you want to use it to pay SEM, again, you're eating into the compound interest. If you, if you were young and in 20 years from now, you are eating into that. 10, 15 year, but whatever, it's it's there. You can use it for certain things. But at least for now, it's very good to put it there, not just to a savings account, even if you're not investing it yet, because you can't touch it. it it's healthy. It sits there. It, it's, it's real money. It's good, but you can't touch it. Savings account, if banks were smart, they'd make it. You can't touch it. <laughs> it it's basically like a checking account, but one transfer away. It's, it's the same difference. Um, um, you could also invest in real estate and make it our... Um, a return on investment there. Of course, with real estate, it's not the uh, tax benefit of the I IRA. I don't think you could invest in that, but it's still, you can get the return on investment and do all these things. So the point is compound interest. Fine. Now that the educational side, um, I'll end off with Q&A, but I'll ask myself a few questions and then I'll, I'll open it up. So one, one uh, uh, question is how to actually save the mindset. I'll give a cute story for my son. He's now four. This happened maybe two years ago when he was two. So we're eating dinner and he throws his fork across the table and then he asks for it back. So I said, why should I give it back? He just threw it across the table. He said, need it. I said, if you needed it, why'd you throw it? He said, like it. He likes throwing it. What does that mean? A person's likes or wants or desires, those actually supersede people's needs. It's a very true emotion. <laughs> he needed the fork for dinner, but he likes throwing it. He's willing to sacrifice his need for using it by throwing it. So it's very hard to get into the mindset because even if we know we need it, we need to save, we need to invest, it's very important. We like it. It's good to buy ice cream. It's good to buy a nice car. I don't know. I don't have a nice car, but it's good to buy a nice car. It's good to buy a whatever. You know, like it. It's, very, it's a very important thing to recognize that the mindset is where it starts. I have a friend even who, uh, when he was just got married, was very good and put a few dollars a week into savings and then had two kids and took every week out from savings. <laughs> the mindset has to really be very strong. Um, I wrote what app to use. I, I'm not promoting an app. You probably could. I probably could send a link around and make $5 a link from the apps. I don't know. But I have, uh, I don't know, Robinhood, whatever. You could open. Actually, I have TD Ameritrade as a free app. I don't know if it's the best. I don't even have TD Bank, but but uh, that's where I started my uh, tax investment thing. Um, an interesting point, again, this is maybe like for budgeting and other things. I'm not going to get into it all right now, but just it, it's good to have in mind that a target income for the future and budgeting. Beryl made mention of this, and uh, it's really important. You have to make a lot of money. <laughs> As a from family, you, you talk to have to make money. 
it's very expensive. It, I'm, I'm saying this not as like a sad thing, as a good thing. Baruch Hashem. You have to make a lot of money. Um, it, it's important, even when buying a house and all these things. It, it, have in mind, target income is very important. Um, even with investing, I, I said the 35-year investment thing, but obviously if you want to buy a house you don't have yet, don't put all of your savings into the 35-year vehicle. Put it into something. I, I'm just showing, I, I'm proving you literally can become a millionaire by, by right now, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, investing with when young. But I'm not saying, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know, there's a lot of people on here, Baruch Hashem, between 70 and 80 something fluctuating. It's, it's uh, I don't know every person here. Uh, again, don't even ask, don't ask me such specifics. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not licensed, I'm not trained. Um, friendly, I could say a little thought. But, um, you know, have in mind what your budgets are. Uh, I would say step number one is it's good to buy a house. It's good to save for a house. Houses are expensive. I, I, I don't know how people put $100,000 down or more in a house. It's expensive. You have to really save. Um, I think that's about it. I have like a cute thing at the end that, that, that I, a video I watched recently, which I thought was unbelievable and made a huge impact on me. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's good to do that now or take some questions. I don't know. What's, what's a good thought? Wow. Okay. That was amazing. Um, okay. So maybe I'm, I'm thinking it might make sense to take a few questions and then, and then do the video. Are you up for that? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't even going to show the video. Yeah. I was going to just, just explain it, say it. The video is like 15 oh, minutes. Oh, I was gonna okay. say two minutes. But, but it's fine. We can do questions first also. Um, um, I wouldn't even know where to start. Okay. A lot of comments. Do you, do you want me to read them for you? Um, how do you 10 X more with a nine to five job? I mean, this is something, I guess this is uh, 30 minutes back. I apologize for the uh, lack of questions, but um, this is something that, that's how he started his whole thing, Grant Cardone. He 10 x on a salary job. You, you offer more value. I mean, I have, I have like 15 employees and, and um, I would say the most important thing for an employee is actually offer value, offer benefit. Um, it, it's not a healthy thing to tell an employee, like just, just, just offer a value and then I'll pay you and I'll do like without discussing a, you know, a system to it. But it's really important, offer value. Employers, by definition, when I hire an employee, it's money out of my pocket. If I didn't hire them, I could have kept it. But they're offering some value that I need and therefore I'm paying them the money to do it. If they could make me more money or make my life easier, it's worth more money. Um, so offer more value. Uh, uh, how to offer more value is a good question. So he 10 x I'm not saying stay in through the through the end of the night. You know, uh, he was a different scenario. He's not a from guy. He's not Jewish guy. He whatever. But actually, do ten times more effort than the next guy. Um, can someone avoid paying taxes if they give stuck to a nonprofit instead? Again, this is a tax question. I could answer it very briefly, but I'm not an accountant. But when you give taxes, it is a write off for federal taxes. Um, maybe also state taxes. Florida doesn't have. Um, there's something called self-employment taxes or, or it's, what's it called? Medicare and, and uh, you know, what's it called? Whatever, those taxes, it does not go against. Um, there's something called self-employment taxes. Even if you're not self-employed, your employer pays half, you pay half. It's like seven and a half percent each. That tax, you can't, um, deduct it doesn't go against, but federal taxes, it does. Can you repeat can the I, part about I, equity? Yeah. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah, I yeah. wanted to share a, a piece bef um, before we continue the questions that everything that we're learning now really comes in handy, exactly how you said it, if you have a strong mindset to keep it. Um, and with something that has helped me and my family over the last several years that we've been working on these investments and working on um, our financial is to make things automatic. Um, so I don't have to think every month, how much am I putting this month into my Roth or how much am I putting this month into investments or how much am I putting this month into the, it's automatically coming out and it's helping me live with that mindset already. And before I know it, Baruch Hashem, we have, uh, it's been a few years that we've been investing and you turn around and you look and you're like, wow. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would have had the strength to really do that motion every single month. Um, and I also got that from a famous author. His name is David Bach. So if you ever want to look into him, he's great automatic millionaire or um, a lot of good books. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you. There's also a rabbi at Long Island, um, Rabbi Mendy Talden, I believe, um, who is a shliach and he got himself into debt, got out of debt. He's now like helps other shluchim with finances. I watched a little seminar he did. It's very interesting because he built a whole massive spreadsheet with different numbers and everything. And his concept is like, if you um, know your kids too, your son's too in 11 years, is his bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah costs, I, I don't know, I didn't throw bar mitzvah yet, but I don't know, I've heard expensive, 15, $20,000. 
and um, he said, okay, so he has a calculator built in. If you save this amount now, the whole calculation shows save $500 a month or something. So then he, he says, okay, in his calculation, he has one thing with the automatic calculator and the other is realistic. He says, okay, I'm not gonna save $500 a month for my son's bar mitzvah, but I'll save uh, 50 bucks a month. When it rolls around, I, I'm gonna have in 11 years. So I'll have 20% uh, of our mitzvah paid for. I don't have to come up. Okay, the, so there is a nice thing of that concept also. If you have a goal, you, it's good to calculate like what I'm showing. Good, I have $2 million. You know, you can't plan ahead. Amir Tashem in 10 years from now, Everyone's financial situation is very good and you could save more. I mean, mine Baruch Hashem is much better now than it was three years ago. You know, I'm saving a lot more now than I was three years ago. So it's not an exact uh, linear graph, but if you could make some realistic, first make the, the theoretical beautiful thing, then look realistically, come up with something. I should be saving $5 a month, but what if I put a hundred bucks a month? Um, yeah, and there's systems, yeah. there's systems that do it for you. Meaning it yeah. automatically takes it out of your account so you don't have to go questioning and <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then once a year you do a cheshman, how much am I doing this, uh, this coming year? Yeah. Um, one second. My wife wants to walk by again. I'm going to turn off the video for one second. I apologize. Okay. Um, let's see if she even sees the message. Hold on a second. Thank you. I was muted there. Uh, I muted myself, but I uh, got stuck. Um, okay, someone asked about equity again. Um, I lost my place. But equity, equity is what? I, how do I define it? It's the the value of assets that you have in something, in a company, in a house. Um, okay, market, uh, index fund. Um, I'm not sure. A lot of random questions. It's good. A lot of people help me answer the questions while we're going through. Um, how to choose funds to invest in. Honestly, you could type it in Google, like best S&P 500 funds. Um, you'll see ones that they, they have something called an expense ratio. We'll say like for every thousand dollars, like 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Some are free. Some are 0 0.02, 0 0.01 means like a dollar for every thousand dollars invested. It's really, really cheap. Um, and that means that there's some company basically following the market, uh, uh, running this fund. I personally invested all my money into like three different ones. Here, I'll read it off actually. Although again, um, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not advising that the market like tomorrow is going to go up. Don't hate me if you invest and tomorrow goes down. But um, ugh, I'm logged out. I don't know my, uh, can't do it. I'm logged out automatically on my phone and I don't know. Oh, there, it logged me in. I have one symbol of DJI. It's not the company DJI. It's, it's uh, it follows it. I have, that's my watch list. Never mind. Don't write that down. Isn't that was a uh, that was a down Jones and whatever. I can't. I'm logged out right now, so I can't see it. Anyway, I could I could show later, but just Google it. You'll see. Um, it, it was a watch list. I didn't realize it was. I thought it was the account. Um, hard to find people to trust for financial advice. Trust me. No, I don't know. It's very hard. Um, very very hard to find. And um, but again, I don't know how much it depends. Financial advice. Like right now, Baruch Hashem, I'm looking into financial advice myself to try and avoid taxes, although people are saying pay more because you want the highest tax uh, return. To be clear, I'm not avoiding taxes illegally. There are legal ways of avoiding it. Um, anyway, can you spell the app you use? Um, it was, it was uh, there's Robinhood, then there's TD Ameritrade, Ameritrade. There's a lot of apps, they're, they're all fine. I, I recommend all the trading, do it free. Shouldn't have to pay anything per transaction. There's so many apps, shouldn't have to pay a thing. Um, so much information for me, sorry. Um, okay, I'll do something interesting. Um, something really, really interesting. This blew my mind. I sent it to my sister, my brother-in-law, my father. My, I sent it to everyone that I knew. It was very, very interesting. This is not my thing, but I find it really fascinating. Here, I'm getting my little whiteboard, my pen and paper. It's the definition of value. You also have to excuse my handwriting. This is gonna be terrible on the screen and my handwriting, it's not gonna be good. Is it backwards? No, good, not backwards. Can you see it though? Here, I actually, to being professional, I have a light here, I'll turn it off so that you could see it better. 
here. That's a little darker, but you could probably see it if it's the right side of the paper. There we go, value. Definition of value, it's a fraction. The top of it is delivery of dream. You have delivery of a dream. You sell someone a dream, right? I'm offering value. The example he gave, I'll give. He was a fitness guy, so excuse the example, but he's comparing um, fitness, working out, to surgery to lose weight. So delivery of dream, helping someone come better fit, you know, lose weight, get in shape. Then the other side of that top part is likelihood to fulfill dream. My handwriting is atrocious, but likelihood to fulfill the, to fulfill the dream. So you have the dream, then likelihood to fulfill it. So with likelihood to fulfill it, um, you know, fitness, you could say is less likely than a surgery. Hold on one second. Now the bot, then there's a fraction, the bottom half. I'll explain it nicer when I do it. I have never formally given this over in a seminar, but it's really good. Okay, the bottom half has two things also. Delay of delivery and effort needed. Delay of delivery, something called the whiteboard on Zoom. Hmm, that, that's good. Um, I don't know how to do that. Pretty good with tech, but okay. Delay of delivery is how soon do you get your results? And then the last one is effort needed. So these on the bottom half, you wanna be like any fraction, you want the bottom half to be low. You want the top half to be high, yeah? So delay of dream, uh, delivery of dream. You want to sell a high dream. I wanna sell a great product. I wanna sell you know, something that's gonna be unbelievable. And the likelihood of it, I wanna convince you that it's extremely likely you're gonna get it. You know, I'm gonna. I'm selling you a piece of real estate. I want to sell you the biggest real estate. I want to explain to you that that it's very likely that you'll have a big family. It'll be beautiful. The value is gonna go up. I don't know, whatever it is. The bottom half is delay of delivery. I want it to be as low as possible. I want as soon as you buy it, you get your dream, the as as, as quick as possible. It's not always uh, immediate, but as quick as possible. And then finally, effort needed. This is actually a cute conclusion because it uh, you could you could uh, see how uh, how much value I'm giving. <laughs> so then finally effort needed in general people want to do the least effort needed so what does this look like what does this mean and actually his thing was explaining why for gym membership it takes him he, he actually had a business where he sold he actually owned dozens of gyms and had to sell thousands of memberships and he was trying to sell like like uh, year-long memberships for i don't know a thousand dollars so he was explaining how come it takes me so long to sell a thousand dollar gym membership but a $50,000 surgery is actually very easy to sell. So here's what he did. Let's get another piece of paper. Um, working out and surgery. Again, excuse the example, but this is what he gave. It's the easiest to give us. So working out and surgery. So let's do the first, delivery of dream. Working out. Is it guaranteed? Is, is, is the dream going to be there? I mean, frankly, no. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. The dream exists. It exists, the dream. So I'll give it a one. Yeah? I'm selling a dream. It's there. The surgery. Is the dream there? Am I selling the dream? The dream is there. I'll give it a one. However, the likelihood, the likelihood of working out, unfortunately, statistically speaking, most gyms make their money because people pay membership and never show up. <laughs> Hopefully, you could save better than you could go to the gym. People will never go to the gym. So the, the working out, the likelihood of selling that dream, I'm gonna put a zero. It's not so likely. The surgery, the likelihood is pretty much guaranteed. You're gonna, you're gonna lose weight. They're, they're, they're doing whatever they do. So now the bottom half, delay of delivery, working out. Say you do work out. It could take a year to see results. I mean, honestly, I, I started uh, doing exercise myself about six months ago and, and Baruch Hashem, you changed your mindset, changed your whole life. But I'm saying to see like results, whatever that means, work, you know, it could take a year or two years, but at whatever your, your, your fitness goal is, delay of delivery is quite large. So I'm going to put a zero. Surgery, delay of delivery. I mean, it's pretty much, I don't know, immediate, uh, week, two weeks when you recover. So I'll give it a one. Effort needed. Hmm, this is an easy one. <laughs> fitness, effort needed. A lot of effort. I'm going to give it a zero. Surgery, effort needed. You don't need any effort. One. So the, the column on the left, I don't know if you could see this at all. Can you see it? I, I'm doing this whole thing on my... So here, it got a score of one, and this got a score of four. Working out only ticked off one, one thing of value. 
surgery ticked off all four. Again, I'm not suggesting therefore get surgery, don't work out. It, it, it's just explaining the, the logic. And he, this guy, by the way, who gave the thing, his, he's buffed up. He's, I mean, he believes in fitness. It's clear which one he believes in. That being said, he's just explaining how come it's so hard to sell a $1,000 gym membership, but a forty fifty thousand dollars surgery is very easy. Now, this could apply to anything in life. It could apply to any business, any service, anything, including this seminar you could see. Okay, my, my advice, how much value am I giving? So this blew my mind. So he said that most people focus on the top half, how to, to, to go up, delivery of dream, you know, the dream itself. How can I sell a bigger dream? Sell a bigger dream, I'm giving more value. Other people say the likelihood. I'll have, he said when he started his business, he gave a thousand testimonials. People saying, how prove how likely it is you'll actually get your dream. So that's what he used to focus on. A lot, I, I focus on those things often as a business as well. Uh, you know, sell the dream, sell the likelihood to fulfill the dream. Everyone does that. But really, he said, he's working nowadays in a more sophisticated way. And it doesn't, not everything applies to everything. Some people, it's not, it's not realistic to, to deliver these. My business is a drug rehab. The, the uh, delay of delivery and effort needed are very hard to decrease. It takes a lot of effort. And the delay of delivery is, is, I don't know how to define it. You know, the statistics show if you stay sober for 30 days, you, you're, you're a better shot than not. You know, it, I can't really play around with those metrics too much. Although you could say delay of delivery is immediately when they come, they could already feel like they're in a certain environment. I, I don't know, whatever, that's my business. Nonetheless, he said he's focusing on this more. And it's very interesting because some of the biggest companies in the world nowadays only focus on these. Say Uber, are they selling such a dream? I mean, it's such an amazing dream. I'm gonna get you from here to there. I mean, get in the car, bicycle, walk, and the dream is, is, is barely there. What they're selling is delay of delivery is I'm, gonna, I'm not going to delay it at all. You'll, you'll get delivered immediately. You go on your Uber app, you can, get, you, can, you can get there very quickly. In fact, there's on Lyft, I, just, I heard this in the video. I don't even really use Lyft. I live in Folk. I don't use Uber or Lyft either. <laughs> but on Lyft, they even have a feature nowadays. You could pay extra to get it within like 60 seconds. People are willing to pay more money. Why? Because they're proved the value is the lay of delivery is going down. And then effort needed, of course, Uber is very easy to use. I'm not having to walk, not having to run, not having to do much. I push a button. So a lot of these things nowadays is the, the, the dream doesn't have to be the biggest chiddush in the world. You don't have to come up with, you don't have to reinvent bread. If you could just find a way to deliver it to people quicker or make it easier for them to get the supplies of bread or, or uh, make it uh, whatever, you know, it's, You've actually given value. The dream is barely there. The dream has existed. They say sliced bread is, is you know, nothing's new since then. You could literally sell sliced bread, but faster and easier or easier to make or some things. I mean, you see this with, uh, what's it called? Duncan Hines. We don't use Duncan Hines in my house. My wife's a baker, but, but Duncan Hines, they, they give you the box ready to go. The, the product is no more. It's not a better tasting brownie than homemade. It's just easier. So anyway, in value, this is the four. It, it, again, it, the, the goal is not to do all four. I mean, ultimately it's great too, but it, it's amazing. Whatever you do, I don't care. It could, you could be a teacher, by the way. You want to know what value am I providing to my students? Um, it, it might, the, the dream might not be different. It's the same chumash you're teaching, but maybe you could make it a little easier for them to understand, a little less effort or the delay of delivery. Teach them a certain lesson they could achieve very quickly. Um, it's so funny. This wasn't my whole talk tonight, but uh, I think <laughs> besides compound interest, this, this blew my mind. I thought it was really interesting. You could zoom in on each one and think, I, with my father, we sat down, we're, we're business partners. I sat down afterwards going through each one individually. Okay, what can I, which one, how could we do? Well, it seems like this doesn't apply to us. If it did, what could we do? Maybe it can't, but what could we do? So again, for shluchas, for business, for relationships, right? I, I mean, whatever, I'm maybe stretching, I don't know, maybe relationships, I don't know. But certainly when you're trying to sell something, when you want, to, the key is value. When you want to provide value to someone, this is his definition of value. And I, you know, again, I'm, I don't know if his lifestyle is my lifestyle, but he's very successful. He knows how to provide value to people. And I, I uh, find that very interesting. That was that. Someone said, where can I watch this video? I could send it to whatever, to, to Michal, I guess. It's just, it, it's, I think I'm better at saying it than he is. No, no, no. But he, he says it longer. It's like a 20 minute video explaining it. Um, any other questions or anything? Uh, can you, um, I know you're not a financial advisor, but what, yeah. once people jump off of the Zoom, what, what should we do? What do you suggest? First step. First step. And again, I, if I was really, really smart, I would have like a referral link for like Robinhood. Maybe I should make one. No, it's not even for me. I think both sides each get like five or 10 bucks or something. 
whatever. Don't I, worry, honestly, I'll give you the one from Acorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Acorn's a little different. If, if you talk a lump, by the way, I, I, whatever, honestly, it's not big money. I'm saying it's, if 20 people did it and make 100 bucks, I would give it to, to living Hasidus. Maybe talk, by the way, a takeaway. I'll put, I'll put the obligation on someone else here. Make a, whoever wants to do it would also make 100 bucks himself. Uh, maybe Michal could do it. Make, make, make a Robinhood account or one of these. I, I could send you a link. I could do two seconds of research myself. And the referral code you send around, each person would get, and whoever makes it gets, you know, the chunk of it. it it's not much money. It's not gonna, uh, whatever. But um, but it's worthwhile. So anyway, download one of those apps and set up an automated thing. You don't even have to invest it. When you open, okay. When you when you start the app, you could click again. I'm not an accountant, but you can click wh how what kind of account you want it to be, what kind of box. So you could say Roth IRA, <laughs> Roth IRA is the box. So you could then set up, it says like add funding method or something, you connect it to your bank account. And then you could set up an automated thing for whatever amount you decide. I see someone posted it, um, a, a referral link. Um, anyway, you could set up an automated thing, whatever dollar amount you find appropriate. And, and you don't even have to invest it yet. I mean, at some point you should, if 35 years go by and you didn't invest it, it's, 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 uh, you missed the whole point, but you don't even have to invest it today. It shouldn't delay you because you don't know what to invest. You don't feel comfortable in the current market. You want to wait a few months, which maybe I'd recommend at this point. Nonetheless, start the Roth IRA and have the automated funding, like Michal said, and just fund. And that's it. You'll turn around. Even if, if six months go by, you didn't invest it yet, you'll see you have money there. And at some point, hopefully in six months, God, I hope that that uh, that uh, the market stabilizes. Then then invest it, and 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 then the key is then forget about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't get heartache. Um, I've lost uh, thousands of dollars in the last few weeks, and uh, the roulette ball is still spinning. Don't even think about it. Um, I mean that's so, that, that's yeah. What what do you suggest between Robinhood and Acorn? Like what? What Acorn? What? Acorn's a different, officially a different product. Acorn officially rounds up to the nearest dollar, which is. It's I mean, you cute, can also set mind, it as yeah. we, You can set it as weekly or monthly. Like you can set it as. Okay, so that's good. I don't know. Um, I, I had Acorns. I don't really use it. Like I, I turned. I don't know. I you turned it off. You could do Acorns. Acorns is a cute platform, but um, I don't know it could on the other hand be annoying. It could skim. I, I don't know. I mean, I. I, I Acorn. What was that? Yeah, if basically somebody was. Somebody's saying that if you invest in random stocks on Robinhood, it's a good way to lose money. So what? Let's say you open Robinhood. Then no. So Ro Robinhood again. Unfortunately, here. Ready? I'll just open up my computer. Give me one second. Um, one second. I'll post a link even in the thing. Um, I'll post in one second. But basically, there there is something called an index fund. It's a fund that follows the S and P five hundred. Again, the S P five hundred is a standard. It's not. It's not a. Um, it's not, it's not a, what's it called? It's not a fund. You can't invest in it. Here, ready? Index fund SP 500. Okay, the best SP 500 funds of 2022. Here, I'm just gonna post this link. It's from Forbes. You could see each one. They have the expense ratio, like I said. I mean, I would stay in the lower end, but I don't know, whatever. It doesn't make such a difference. Here, ready? I'm gonna post it to everyone here. I'm not recommending a specific one. They, they, they basically all do the same thing. They're just different price points. Some are $20, some are $100, but they follow all the same thing. If you look on a chart that shows the S&P 500 and your fund, they will literally make the same shape because it just follows that. Um, so I would put it into one of those funds that follow the S&P 500. Um, again, it, it, nowadays, unfortunately, it's a bit of a good opportunity to lose money still because <laughs> the market is down right now but historically it it it, it, it goes up historically it averages 10 and percent even more in the last 10 years um punct uh, we're giving this uh this speech when it's it's going down but um well it's, so it's, on, sale. I, it's on sale yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's you get to buy it and uh... <laughs> yeah um whatever I, I can't speak to when to put it when, when to actually invest the funds but i would recommend immediately starting the the investment account and start funding it. Um, I, but, but also bear in mind, I'm not an accountant or anything, but if you if you do want to touch it or any, well, two things. One is if you want to touch the money, there are ramifications. There, there is a penalty unless it's for certain things. The second thing is there are tax benefits. Um, if you do the Roth IRA, there's no tax benefits the second, but if you do other ones, there are tax benefits because it's a write-off. You don't have to pay tax on that money. Um, it depends. I, I'm, I'm doing a different thing called a SEP, SEP. You could fund it much more than 6,000 a year, um, but it's not the, the, it's a write-off now. 
So right now I get to Baruch Hashem avoid paying those taxes. And in the future, when I'm no longer working in a lower tax bracket, I could, I could then take it out and sell it, whatever. Um, so there's all different ones, but for, you know, I, again, I don't know anyone here, but in general, for the general population, a Roth IRA is a very good vehicle. It's a good starting point to do $5 a month. If you make above a certain income, you can't even get a Roth IRA. Um, so if you make a good amount of money, you should look into that. Um, Roth IRA or life insurance. I don't know. Again, I'm not, I'm not an investing guru. Honestly, I have, I have a whole life policy. I have Roth IRA. I don't know if it's good or not. I don't know. <laughs> Um, you should ask someone who actually knows their stuff. Um, what's with SoFi? It's another platform you could do it with. Isn't Robinhood the one that caused your heartache? <laughs> the, the heartache wasn't caused by Robinhood. It was caused by the, the stocks of investing. Um, anyway, um, what if you plan on buying a house within the next year or two? You know, so I said that again, I'm not a financial advisor. I think number one is to save for a house. It's very hard to save for a house. I don't know how people do it. I mean, really, it's, it's very, very hard. Hopefully family helps a little bit or whatever. Um, I recommend definitely save for a house. To the contrary, all these financial guys, even though they, they're missing the why, one thing that they have is frugality. They really save a lot. They save a lot of money. They don't spend and they could spend. They have the money to spend. They don't spend. Um, personally, I'm very frugal. I'm very generous. Baruch Hashem, I give a lot of tzedakah, but when it comes to myself, I really... You know, I mean, it's good to be healthy. It's good to have a house, good to whatever, but it's good to save. It's very, very good to save. Um, so yeah, buying a house. I mean, I, I, I don't know who posts that on the name. It's period, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, I, <clears throat> I recommend saving for the house, but ultimately for long term, it's good to have different savings. Even in mind, as a firm person, you could have like the wedding fund, the, the retirement fund, or whatever. Like my life insurance policy, I had in mind that it's like a wedding fund. It, it, I, I worked out the number. Is it okay? I could withdraw in 20 years, 25 years, a certain amount, and then it keeps growing. And then I don't know, whatever. Um, I don't know why. Again, I don't know if it's the best or not the best. It's just what I did at the time a few years ago. But again, when you're young with life insurance, it's much cheaper um, because you're young. In fact, with life insurance, I highly recommend everyone get a policy. I have a whole life. I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm really not a financial advisor, but it's important to have. If you want to get a term policy, it's super cheap. It could be five to twenty dollars a month, depending on how young you are. But it's really the responsible thing to do, and and it's it's a uh, insurance policy. Well, my parents, when we lived in New York, they bought a, a snowblower, and they bought a five year insurance policy, and they uh, five year warranty, whatever. And they knew for five years it's not going to snow, <laughs> and it's true. So when you buy a life insurance policy, you're not going to need it. That's the bracha. So so uh, it's it's really a good thing to have. Um, again, I, I'm not, I don't, there, there's apps where you could buy it. If I was smart, I'd have a referral link. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm not making money off of it. It's a recommendation. Um, maybe if there's like one or two questions left, then I got to go to sleep. This time change, uh, my kids didn't yeah, uh, was, hear about it. I was actually going to ask, Baruch Hashem here at Living Chassidus, we have an amazing tradition. Um, it's called a selfie with our speaker. So I was wondering if you're up for that. Are you up for a selfie with our whole group? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So if everybody feels comfortable um, and you want to turn on your camera, we are going to Imer Tashem have, and then I guess Brach will let us know. Can you let us know? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey, I was just getting a few seconds for everybody to turn their camera on to want it on. Okay, everybody, one, two, three, just smile. Go ahead and smack you. We got it. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we really appreciate you coming here tonight, right, Nesanoff, and spending this time with us and all the information you gave us. We hope to have you back again. It's Hashem. Um, and if everyone could take a moment and just think, um, one second, tonight's event is literally Nishmas for Leah Bas Yechanan. She should have an alias and neshama. We should have be reunited with our loved ones right now with Mashiach. And I want to thank every single one of you for taking the time to join us tonight and learn and gain and grow. And there was actually a comment over here that says, would women be interested in a women's money club? 
So yeah, it's Hashem. We could uh, organize something like that. So I guess be in touch with me and yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank Hashem you. Should bend you add bleed die. I mean, that's luck, Rabbit, everyone. And uh, actually, do it. Don't turn around in thirty years and regret it. <laughs> do something. Yes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.